the affairs of trust. That when a person comes to you seeking your advice, seeking your guidance, seeking your opinion on something, that you must advise them with the best advice that is known to you. That you do not give them anything that will misguide them. Or that they think they're after to do something that actually is not good for them because you have deliberately or ignorantly, even if you mean well, but because of ignorance that you have misguided a person, whether it be from the affairs of deen or from the affairs of dunya. So therefore, it is tremendously important that first and foremost that when you are seeking advice, my sisters, that you seek advice from those who know and are mature and have understanding. And that if you are asked to give advice but you know that you are not fit, then you should not put yourself forward to give advice in affairs that are beyond you. In that vein, we have this next chapter in Al-Adab Al-Mufrad, Bab Al-Mashwara, or the chapter on consultation. So Imam Bukhari, and this is Hadith 257, where Imam Al-Bukhari, he said that Sadaqa narrated to us, saying that Ibn Uyayna, and he is Sufyan, Ibn Uyayna, informed us from Umar bin Habib, from Amr bin Dinar, who said that Ibn Abbas, he recited, وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي بَعْدِ الْأَمَرِ and consult with them in some of the affairs. And that is related to the ayah where in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Ali Imran, وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمَرِ and consult with them, O Prophet, in the affairs. And this chain of narration, it is authentic, it is sahih. Alongside that comes the next hadith which has a, or the next author, the next uh, statement of one of the salaf of this ummah. That Imam al-Bukhari, he said, that Adam ibn Abi Iyas narrated to us, and he said that Hamad ibn Zayd narrated to us from Sarri, from Al-Hassan, who said, the Hassan who said, and this is Al Hassan al Basri, that he said, By Allah, people have never consulted with others seeking their advice except that they were guided to that which is best of that which was before them. Except that they were guided to the best of that which was before them. Then he recited, وَأَمْرُهُمْ شُورَ بَيْنَهُمْ Wherein Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned and those who conduct their affairs by mutual consultation from Surah Al-Shura, ayah number 38. The point here being that Al-Hassan that he said That by Allah, people have never consulted with others seeking their advice except that they were guided to the best of that which was before them. Meaning that upon a person that he does not lose out when he consults with the people. Sheikh Zayd al-Madkhali in his explanation uh, by the way, that narration from al-Hassan it is authentic. It is. It is not. Is sahih. Sheikh Zayd al Madkhali he said that Allah subhanahu wa taala that he commanded the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the Prophet alayhi salatu wasallam bil bil mashwara commanded him to make consultation to seek the counsel of his companions in some of the affairs. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned that in his book, in Surah Ali Imran, ayah number 
وشاورهم في الأمر فإذا عزمت فتوكل على الله and consult with them in matters and then when you have made your decision put your trust in Allah so it is important barakallahu feekum that we follow this guidance of Allah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this instruction of Allah for his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and for the ummah wa shawirhum fil amr and consult with them in matters and when you have taken a decision put your trust in Allah and he sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the example for this ummah so if the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was commanded by Allah to consult and seek counsel with his sahaba radiyallahu anhum then even more so that the rest of the muslims should seek counsel indeed they are more in need than the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was because the rest of the muslims are more in need of consulting between each other and seeking advice from one another and Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in that famous hadith ad-deenu nasiha that the religion is sincere advice and he repeated it sallallahu alayhi wa sallam three times ad-deenu nasiha so this is the affair of seeking advice and giving sincere advice so if an affair perplexes a Muslim from the affairs of his or her deen or dunya from your worldly affairs or your deeny affairs whether it be connected to marriage or divorce or choosing a school for your child or a place to live or to buy a place to live or whether you are going to put your money into a particular business all of these types of affairs you should consult with others before you make hijrah, after you make hijrah, where to make hijrah to, for example. Then it is best for him in the affairs of the deen and dunya that cause you to become perplexed or that you are indecisive or that you know generally what to do. But maybe someone else can advise you with something that may make it better for you or give you a better way of doing that which you are aiming to do. So when an affair is placed in front of a Muslim and he needs to make a decision, then it is best for him to seek advice and counsel from someone that you trust, my sisters, who will look at the issue, that they will not carry the news that you are giving them to others. You know, because some of these affairs, they require a certain amount of trust that you don't want the whole dunya to know. In fact, you don't want anyone to know except the one that you are asking advice regarding. So the one that you seek the advice from should be a person who is trustworthy, honest and truthful, wise, who will give sincere advice to you, fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That person will study and look at the affair and give good counsel so it doesn't have to be one person sometimes you may go to one or two or three people but the important point is that they are trustworthy and that they are mature and that they have knowledge of the affair that you are asking them concerning and that they know you because sometimes the affair is related to a person's character so you're, look, so you're about to take a job or take a position somewhere. So that is related to whether you fit into that job or fit into that relationship if you're about to get married. So now the person that you will ask has to have certain fine qualities and certain characteristics and attributes. So that person should know you. So you're about to you know, embark upon marriage, for example, or choose a marriage partner. 
So the person that you are asking, you say to them, well, you know me. Do you think that I would fit into a marriage like that, in a home like that, in a country like that, in a town like that? Could I live in a community? Because you know me. I think I can. What do you think? So the person you are asking is going to be honest with you, truthful with you. They know you and they have wisdom and they have maturity. They are not flippant. They are not hasty. They don't tell you something and then you realize actually they were just, you know, they were just gossiping with you but not really giving you sincere advice and you acted upon it and it damaged you. So after that, after you have received that advice from one person or two people, <clears throat> then you have a choice <clears throat> to take the advice and counsel that you've been given from your Muslim brother or from your sister or not to take it as you see fit. Because now you can judge whether this advice that you've been given, is it for my benefit in my deen and my dunya or is it not? So the point is that the one that you seek counsel from is not the one who is, you know, forcing you into anything or compelling you with anything, but rather they're giving you sincere advice and counsel. Unless it is, it is an affair of the wajibat, from the affairs of the obligation, the prohibitions, then yes, then they can command you. You, can't, you must do that because it is obligatory from Allah. For example, hajj or zakah or salah or obedience to parents and so on. Or it is a prohibition, so they can command you. You're not allowed to do that because that involves riba. But as for those affairs where there is, you know, it is upon ihtimal, there's a possibility that it is good for you or bad for you, or there are better ways for it, but it is not connected to the halal and haram, then the choice is yours ultimately. But let's say you went to three people, all three of them are trustworthy. And they have knowledge and they are truthful and they are sincere from what is apparent from them and they are from the people of Sunnah. And they all three of them advise you with the same thing. Then what does that do to your heart? It makes you feel better. Okay, so they see what I see. Or if it contradicts what you were thinking, then you can say, Subhanallah, I saw it this way and all of these three are saying the opposite to me. Maybe I'm wrong. So then you begin to question yourself, which is good because now you reflect. You reflect over the affair. And therefore you protect yourself from maybe something that may have been bad for you or harmed you. And this is through the advice of, you know, from the people of Islam and Iman. People who care about you. And even if they don't know you, meaning that they don't know you well, they know you from a distance, but they are still sincere advisors because you know that there are certain people within the community or within your family that they are honest and truthful. And everyone knows them for their trustworthiness, honesty and truthfulness. That they will be straight with you and be honest with you. So a, a Muslim, especially on those things that will have, you know, long-term impact upon your life, from those affairs is marriage and divorce. And where you live. So when you get married, for example, you leave one city to go and live in another city. But that could be for the next 30, 40 years. So you're not making a decision for tomorrow or for the week. You are making a decision that may have an impact for decades to come. What if you marry someone and you think to yourself, well, I wouldn't mind living in such and such a country. But you're not really paying attention to what it means to live in such and such a country thousands of miles away from your mother, your father, your brothers, your sisters and your community. But maybe that is good for you. You may not have thought about it. Maybe you go to someone and they explain to you, well, actually, you know, if you go to that country, you can come back, but your husband can't because he doesn't have permission to enter your homeland because, you know, there's some sort of problem with people from that country entering into the land where your mother and father live. So then, you know, you start contemplating and thinking and reflecting, is this the right choice for me? It may be or it may not be. But if you don't seek counsel and consultation, you're not going to know. It is tremendously important that the believer in these types of affairs, that they consult. So this hadith emphasizes that ishtishara, that this 
you know, this seeking and making consultation, seeking advice and counsel, istishara, that it is to be followed by guidance to the best of the affairs. For this reason, it is said, there is no regret in consultation and there is no loss in seeking istikhara from Allah. Meaning that you will never regret, inshallah, if you consult good people, honest people, truthful people who care about you and care about your future, even if they don't know you, but their character is that they care about the believers. So there's no regret in consulting them, even if it goes against what you were thinking and what was, you know, what you were tending towards. It doesn't matter because they are giving you sincere advice. So if that conflicts with what you were thinking, maybe now you need to go to a second person, but not to find someone who agrees with you, but just to see whether that person, what they've told you, whether actually it is something that I'm getting wrong or did they get it wrong? Let me ask a third person or a fourth person. In marriage, you would do that. In hijrah, you would do that. In the land which you live in, you would do that. Where am I going to stay? House that you buy, for example, if you're going to buy property in a Muslim country. You would not just ask one person. You may ask two or three. And you may ask people who may not be so connected to the religion, but they know the affairs of housing and construction and building. So they may not be religious people in the sense that, you know, you, do, you look at them outwardly and they don't really come across as people of sunnah, but they know their trade well. Building, construction, buying, selling, housing. And what you've heard and what you know is that this person is truthful and honest and you can go to several of them so when you seek consultation in affairs, as the saying goes, then there is no regret. In consultation, there is no regret. And in making istikhara to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is no loss. So both of these matters, istishara and istikhara, meaning seeking consultation, Seeking consultation and likewise making istikhara are legislated in the book of Allah and the Sunnah of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And because of the and because of these two matters, a person achieves for himself or herself a huge amount of goodness. And in opposition to this, you have, or that which is opposite to this is acting arbitrarily with rashness and with recklessness and, in, and with inequity that you're not really weighing, the, weighing up the affairs so you may oppress or that you just act upon a whim. Like in marriage, for example, the last affair ever that you should make upon a whim, especially women, because it is harder for women. Never get married upon a whim. Never get married because that's the only offer that's come to you. Think about whether, forget about how many offers or how many people have approached you. Think about the one who is approaching you. Is he good? Well, if I refuse him, I'm not going to get anything else. You know, is he truthful? Is he not truthful? You have to consider these affairs, his character, his religion. His ability to look after you. His desire for ilm. His religiosity. His steadfastness upon the deen of Allah. His family. His background. Where he lives. Where he comes from. Where he's going to put you. Where he's going to take you. You can't act upon a whim in these types of affairs. No matter how much you desire to marry. Because that is in the nature of men and women that they need to get married. So therefore, in these types of affairs that are life-changing affairs, it is essential that you make consultation and that you make istikhara. 
So do not act arbitrarily, on your own, independently. The number of times, you know, that I've heard, I got married and I think I made a mistake. Well, you made the mistake. What? Two years later, you've realized you've made a mistake. Who did you ask? I didn't ask anyone. He just said that he prays in such and such a masjid and I believed him. He said that he is such and I believe. Oh, you didn't ask anyone. You didn't ask any members of his community. You didn't ask him to bring a written reference with a, with a number that you can contact and say, here, I received this reference. Did you make this reference for this brother? So this hastiness will become the, you know, is, you know, as they say, is the mother of regret. Don't be hasty. Make consultation for your daughters, for your sons, for your families. Consult in the affairs before buying, before selling, before moving, before migrating. So because of these two affairs, istishara and istikhara, a person achieves a huge amount of goodness. And in hastiness and rashness and recklessness without consultation, then it is that that leads to regret and harm. So what are the stages that you take? Number one, choose the affair that you're about to enter into carefully after thorough consideration yourself. Because ultimately, you're going to live with the decision. So that's the first step. The affair that you're about to embark upon, think about it carefully. You consider it for yourself. You think about the pros and cons. You reflect and you ponder, even if you have to write it down. Because sometimes when it's written down in front of you, it makes more sense than it just, you know, moving around in your mind to and fro. But when it's written down on paper, advantages, disadvantages, pros, cons, benefits, masaleh, mafasid, what am I going to benefit? What are the potential harms? What are the dangers? If it's written down in front of you in black and white, you can see it and say, whoa, that's not for me. That's not for me. But as it's wandering in your mind and it's not really firmly resolved, it may not be clear in your mind up until it's put down on paper. So that's the first thing. Choose your affair carefully after thorough consideration. Number two, after you've decided this is something that is, I would like to do. Then consult with those who know. This is the point of istishara. Washawirhum fil amr. And consult with them in the affairs. So consult with them. Your mother, your father, your brother, your sister. The Salafis in your community, if it is a religious affair, or even if it is not a religious affair, consult with those who know, who have religion with them. Because there may be something in there that is haram or disliked and so on. So consult with the people who, as I've mentioned, the examples, truthful, honest, mature, who care about you. They don't lie. They don't deceive. They would give you the advice that they would give to the closest of their own kin. The advice that they would give you is what they would wish for themselves. That type of person. You say, where am I going to find that? They are present, alhamdulillah, whether you know them or whether you don't know them. It doesn't mean, it doesn't necessitate that they are your friends. It might be someone that is unknown to you, meaning that he doesn't know you or she doesn't know you. But they are known in the community amongst the Salafis to be truthful, honest, wise, mature, sincere, advisors, trustworthy. They're not going to carry your secrets. So consult with those who know from the wise and the knowledgeable. Thirdly, make your firm decision. That's why Allah said, وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمَرِ فَإِذَا عَزَمْتَ فَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ And consult with them in the matters. And when you have taken a decision, put your trust in Allah. When you have taken a decision, then put your trust in Allah. How do you put your trust in Allah? Salatul Istikhara. So now you, you've reflected. You know what you want to ask about. You know that this is something that you want to embark upon. 
Number two, you ask those who are trusted and wise. Number three, you make the, deci the decision to do or not to do. The choice is yours. But you make a decision. I'm going to do it. Or I'm not going to do it. Number, th number four, number four, put your trust in Allah. Fatawakkal ala Allah. Put your trust in Allah. So what do you do? How is that to be done? Then that is by making Salatul Istikhara, as the Prophet Sallallahu said in a hadith reported by Al-Bukhari in his Sahih, wherein he said, alayhi salatu wasalam, if any of you intend to undertake a matter, then let him pray two raka'as, two units of prayer. So you make wudu, and you stand and face the qibla, and you make two raka'as of salah, like a nafal prayer. After which, he supplicates to Allah, Allahumma inni astakhiruka bi'ilmika, wa astakdiruka biqudratika, wa as'aluka min fadlika al-azim, fa innaka taqdiru wa la aqdiru, wa ta'lamu wa la a'lam, anta al-allamu al-ghiyub. Allahumma in kunta ta'lamu anna hadha al-amar. So at that point, after reciting it up to there, you mention, you summi, wa you summi al haja, hajatahu. So at that point, a person begins by saying, Oh Allah, I seek the counsel of your knowledge and I seek the help of your greatness and I beseech you. I beseech you for your magnificence or for, for, for your magnificent grace. Surely you are capable and I am not. You know and I know not. For you are the knower of the unseen. So, O oh Allah, if you know that this matter, and that's when you mention the matter. Marrying Fulan, buying Fulan, migrating to such and such a place, you mention the affair. So once you have mentioned the affair to marry so and so, خَيْرٌ لِي فِي دِينِ وَمَعَاشِ وَآقِبَةِ أَمْرِي is better for me in my in my deen, in my religion, and in my life, and in the end result of my affair. فَقْدُرْهُ لِي وَيَسِّرْهُ لِي ثُمَّ بَارِكْ لِي فِيهِ وَإِن كُنْتَ تَعْلَمُ أَنَّ هَذَا الْأَمْرِ شَرٌ لِي فِي دِينِ وَمَعَاشِ وَآقِبَةِ أَمْرِي فَاسْرِفْهُ عَنِّي وَاسْرِفْنِي عَنْهُ وَاقْدُرْ لِي الْخَيْرَ هَيْثُ كَانَ ثُمَّ أَرْدِنِي بِهِ then, he, then you would say that if you know that this affair is good for me in my religion and in my life for my welfare and for the goodness in the life to come or in the hereafter, then ordain it for me, decree it for me, and make it easy for me. Then bless me in that affair. And if you know, O oh Allah, that this matter is bad for me in my religion, and bad for me in my life, and for my welfare, in the akhirah, in the, in the life to come, in the hereafter, then distance it from me and distance me from it and ordain for me that which is good wherever it may be. And oh Allah, make me pleased with that which you have decreed. So this is the Salatul Istikhara or the Dua of Al Istikhara. And when you have made this Dua after praying the two Nafal, then you carry on as the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَإِذَا عَزَمْتَ فَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ Then when you have taken a decision, put your trust in Allah. Just go ahead and do it. And if it is bad for you, my sisters, Allah will turn it away from you, inshallah. 
If it is bad for you, Allah will turn it away from you. And if it is good for you, Allah will bring it, bring you to it, and bring you, bring it, bring it to you, and bring you to it. And Allah will bless it for you. So this is the manner of coming to a decision in affairs that perplex you, or that you need to make a decision that is important to you. These are the four stages. Choose your affair, consult in the affair, make your decision in the affair, make istikhara, and then execute the affair. Carry it out. The next chapter is the chapter Bab Ithmu man ashara ala akhihi bi ghayri rushdin. The chapter, the sin of the one who gives his brother bad advice. Imam al-Bukhari, he mentioned hadith number 259 that Abdullah bin Yazid said that Sa'id bin Abi Ayyub narrated to us and he said that Bakr bin Amr narrated to me from Abu Uthman, Muslim bin Yasar from the companion Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu who said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَنْ تَقَوَّلَ عَلَيَّ مَا لَمْ أَقُلْ فَلْيَتَبَوَّأْ مَقْعَدَهُ مِنَ النَّارِ That whomsoever attributes to me that which I did not say, then let, it, let him take his seat in the hellfire. So this portion of the hadith, it is sahih لِغَيْرِهِ Meaning that it is authentic due to supporting narrations. But the, actually, the, the hadith continues. But the portion that I'm about to read to you now, this is the da'if part. It is weak. Where the Prophet Sallallahu is supposed, it is ascribed to the Prophet Sallallahu that he said, and whoever gives his brother misguided advice, when he consults him, then he has betrayed him. That part of the hadith is weak. But however, even though this addition is weak, that whoever gives his brother, gives his brother bad advice or misguided advice, when he consults with him, has betrayed him, even though it is weak, the meaning is correct due to other hadith and what we know from the rights of a Muslim upon a Muslim. nasiha. So when a person comes to you seeking your advice, then you're not supposed to give them misguided advice. You're supposed to give them the best advice. But if you do not give them the correct advice, but instead you cause them to go astray or make the wrong decision because you wish bad for them, then that is betrayal. So even though the hadith is weak, its meaning is correct. So this hadith talks about the prohibition and a warning from ascribing to the Prophet ﷺ that which he did not do, that which he did not say, and that which he did not tacitly approve of. So when a person makes this kind of claim and the claim is not ascribed to the Prophet ﷺ, meaning that it is not what the Prophet ﷺ did or said or allowed, then that is a major sin to ascribe that to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. How do we know it's a major sin? Because the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Let him take his seat in the hellfire," meaning it is as if he is purchasing for himself a place in the nar, in the hellfire. So this is the person who ascribes to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that which he did not say and ascribes to him that which he did not do and ascribes to him that which he did not allow or tacitly approve of. As for the chapter heading of Al-Bukhari here, then it points to the fact that one must not betray his brother or his sister when they seek advice from you that you are not to betray them. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in a hadith that is authentic in Sahih Muslim, المسلم أخ المسلم لا يظلمه ولا يخذله ولا يقطره. That a Muslim is a brother of a Muslim. He does not wrong him. He does not betray him or let him down, and he does not despise him. So that hadith is authentic. That a Muslim is a brother of a Muslim. That you are not to make takhdil. You do not betray them or forsake them. If they need your advice, give them sincere advice. Counsel them correctly. Do not guide them towards that which is bad or that which is evil. 
because you don't want good for them. You only want that good for yourself, but you don't want it for anybody else. That is haram. A Muslim is a brother of a Muslim. If a sister asks you something sincerely, then give them sincere advice. Prophet ﷺ said that the one who is consulted in the hadith that we covered last week or the week before, in Adab al Mufrad, hadith 256, that the one who is consulted is in a position of trust. So you have been placed in a position of trust to fulfill the trust. And if you cannot advise my sisters and you are not able to offer sincere advice, but you'll be biased and prejudiced <clears throat> and you'll give wrong advice, even though you know the truth and don't advise at all. The Prophet wasallam said, Man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawmil akhir, falyaqul khayran awli yasmut. That whomsoever believes in Allah on the last day, let him speak good. Otherwise, remain silent. The hadith in Bukhari. If you're not able to speak good or give sincere advice and be truthful in what you say, then remain silent. Barakallahu feekum. Remain silent. But the amana upon you is that when you are asked, that you fulfill the trust. You're in a position of trust. So if you are going to give bad advice, or misguide or direct them towards that which is wrong then by Allah it is upon you to remain silent don't misguide the believers don't wish evil for the believers give them sins even if you now the one who is coming to you you know that they're upon falsehood advise them to fear Allah because even that is sincere advice fear Allah and stick to the sunnah tamasak bi sunnah stick to the sunnah Hold fast to the sunnah. Stick to the way of the sahaba. That's sincere advice. Worship Allah alone and don't commit shirk. Sincere advice. Pray to Allah five times a day and pay your zakah. Sincere advice. Wear the hijab, my sister. Wear the hijab. Allah has commanded you with it. The advice should be sincere. It should be from the heart. It should be polite. It should be kindly and, and, and it should have within it a sense of generosity that you are giving them something that will benefit them without arrogance or haughtiness. Barakallahu feekum. And upon that note, inshallah, we'll finish for today. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.